will be our 57th lesson in Ephesians. We're in the fourth chapter. Drawing toward the close of it, verses 28 and 29. This is sort of verse you could you could skim over. But uh, we want to exercise ourselves not to do this. The salvation of God is a very, very real deliverance from one environment to another. As Paul said, from, from the power of darkness into the kingdom of God's dear Son. Now the reality of this deliverance has been greatly obscured uh, to the people. The tendency of religious men is to systematize. Yes, that's kind of a tendency. And to simplify. And to exploit the truth of God. That's like a natural tendency. Nobody is free from this tendency. It's there. Some succumb to it and some don't. But when these things happen when there's systemat systematization, simplification, and exploitation of the Word of God, men become, that whole process is earth-centric, that's earth-centered. And it all leads a person to be self-centered. That, that's just how it, how it works. Of course, both of those Earth centricity, self centeredness, they contradict what God is doing. See, it's not just that this is like an aberrant type of behavior over here and you shouldn't be this way. No, this, and what contradicts God's power voids it Amen. for the individual. That's, right. that's, a, that's a big lesson to learn. If you pursue a course, that conflicts with God, you, you forfeit God's power. That, that's the end of the matter. And until you adapt his agenda, you get no power. Now, that's easy to say, but I mean that, that, that is a reality. Here's another reality. It's not possible for man's essential nature to be changed and his conduct remain the same. That's not possible. Because of the approach Satan is fostered and taught to spiritual life, this fact is is hidden to the religious masses. They just, they just don't see it. Men to think and tend to think of life in Christ as a change in habit. It, it, that's, you just do different things, that's all. But see, it's a change of character that results in a change of activity and men tend to think that this this formation of new habits is something that extends over a rather lengthy period of time and kind of like going to elementary school you gradually start doing the right thing and that's how they think of spiritual life but that's an erroneous way of uh, thinking of it now our text tonight calls for an immediate response in someone that was, shall we say, addicted to sin. An abrupt cessation of it. And we're going to find that this is always what God requires. God never allows sin to taper off. It's got a, it's the nature of the kingdom, see. Now here's our text. Remember, he's developing the, what we call the implications of the truth or some might say the application of the truth. He's, he's going in, he, now he's putting a handle on it so you can recognize whether you got it or not. Yeah. If you can't do what he tells you to do, you haven't got what he told you. Yeah. That's a, that's a, but then you can extend your effort to get hold of it, see, that's, here's what he says, let him that stole steal no more. But rather let him labor, working with his hands, the thing which is good, 
that he may have to give to him the needeth. Let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth, but that which is good to the use of edifying, that it may minister grace to the hearers. Amen. It doesn't may, may not sound like those two things go to the <laughs> Go together, but stealing and corrupt communication are in the same room. I tell you, it's liberating to see these things. It just kind of helps you, helps you straighten out your thinking. Because Satan tries to promote this gray area. I think, I believe it was that Aaron mentioned it, a lot of gray areas, different shades of gray, and he tries to get you to think this way, but it's not that way at all. Well, I can testify with the young people at Juvie. And others that I associate with through the police department, that's exactly right. Stealing and corrupt communication go together. Yeah, go exactly together. Right. See, the, the works of the flesh, they all are tied together. And the fruit of the Spirit, it's all, it's all tied together. It's the way it is. And if you have, if you allow one of the traits of the flesh to surface, you have no guarantee that all of them won't surface. And if you allow one aspect of the fruit of the Spirit to surface, the rest will bloom out too. That's the way it is. <laughs> Let him that stole steal no more. This is addressed to a church now. Yeah. The newness of life, the nature of newness of life demands a timely response. This is involved in walking in newness of life. See, it's a it's not placed in newness of life. Yeah? It's not put in the newness of life. It's walking in newness of life. Yeah, the religious environment that prevails in our country, and unfortunately that's been exported to the rest of the world, has failed to see this aspect of the kingdom of God. That the newness of life, as you walk in it, you got to do what you, what you learn needs to be done. you got to do it. Yeah. Not, not set your mind to do it. That's not what I'm saying. Not start to try and do it. That's not what I'm saying. It's got to be done. You say, how can I do it? That's where grace comes in. See, that's, that's where the Holy Spirit comes in. That's where faith comes in. That's where God comes in. But until you endeavor to do it, just as God said to do it, until you do that, grace, the Spirit, and just sit over here on the sideline. Yes. Man. Yes. <laughs> That's right. And the Lord's saying, take up your bed and walk. And he says, I need a couple of weeks of physical right. therapy first. I want to pray about it. Yeah. 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 I want to pray about it first. And, and test my legs and so <laughs> forth. And then I'll get up and walk. <laughs> yeah, I want to try we're at home, not in the public service. I can see whether I'll really be able to do this or not. Yeah, that's right. Now, I want to show this, this instant nature of, the, uh, of king, uh, spiritual life. When Anna came into the presence of the Holy Child, Jesus, at that instant, she gave thanks. You see, right, right away. Paul urged the brethren in Rome, be instant in prayer. You see something that requires divine aid? Right now, instant, see? That's, that's the response. He admonished Timothy, be instant. In season, out of season. It's the preaching of the word. When Jesus wrought miracles, quite frequently, and I give you some of the text here, it said that immediately, so it took place immediately. This is the nature now of divine work. The lame man at the gate, beautiful, immediately arose at the word of Peter. When Peter healed Aeneas, he rose immediately. When the angel instructed Cornelius to send for Peter, he immediately <laughs> did so. And Paul and company, they, they discerned that God was calling them into Macedonia. Immediately they took measures to, to go there. When the brethren detected that Paul was in danger, immediately they, they took measures to bring him safely on his way. 
Paul said, when he God, when Jesus revealed his calling unto him, immediately I conferred not with flesh and blood. When John's on the Isle of Patmos, he heard come up higher. Immediately I was in the sea. That's the nature of the kingdom now. And you're able to determine how much of this kingdom you got. To what extent you really are involved. We're not trying to exclude anybody. Keep in mind, that's... That, that's a, with the last thing you want to do. But it's just a, maze, a means to measure. Like if your response is slow and it takes a while to catch on, you don't want to stay in that kind of state. It's all slowness of heart. Being slow of heart, as Jesus said. It's not acceptable. God doesn't accept that. Slow of heart. Oh, slow of heart to believe. He says to his disciples, slow of heart to believe. Jesus, resurrected Christ, said that to Cleopas. But they were disciples, consistent disciples for three and a half years. They were consistent. So oh, slow of heart to believe. You have to have so much evidence and so much work has to be expended on you before you wake up. There's people like that. You probably... Maybe you're one, I don't know, but if you are, you you got to get out of that category. Our responses to the Lord are not to be marked by delay or hesitation or wavering or vacillation. They're to be instant right now. I mean, there are situations if you don't respond, you'll die. There are situations like that. You've probably been in some like this. If you re, if you look back over your life, you probably will. It will be verified to you that there's some things you got up because you instantly you instantly saw the danger and made you move. See, it's the nature of the kingdom. For this reason, Paul now writes in this manner: a man that demands a res, an immediate response. Let I want to focus for a moment on this. Let him, let him, let him. Other versions say, let the one, or he who, or anyone who, or whoso, or anyone of the person, or the man, or if you, it's, just, it's a, per, a specific person. Now, at this point, he's been talking to everybody. This is different now than he's been doing. He's been talking to everybody up to this point. Ye trusted. Gee, that's the advantage of the King James. Ye means plural. <laughs> ye trusted. Ye heard. Ye believed. Ye were sealed. Ye are saved. Ye are made nigh. See, talking to all the people. Ye are fellow citizens. Ye are building together. When ye read, ye may understand. You being, ye being rooted and grounded. Ye be might be filled. Ye walk worthy. Ye are called, ye henceforth walk, ye have not learned so, so long Christ, ye have heard him, ye put off, ye put on, be ye angry, ye are see, see it's all to the, yeah. to the group. Yeah. Uh, we're not talking to the group now. There's no distinction. There's things you talk about, about things of God, there is no distinction. When we're talking about things that have to do with godliness, there's no distinction. We talk about things we've experienced in grace, there's no distinction. That's everybody has it. Nobody's excluded from it. Like nobody's excluded from the process of growing up into Christ and right in Christ, growing up into Christ and all things. Nobody's excluded. But see that that's that, this hasn't been understood because the majority of the professed believers haven't done this. But that's something everybody's to do. Period. That's the way it is to be. Now that's what we're talking about here. See, there's a marked tendency to generalize about transgression or be lenient toward it or feel sympathy for it, and there's this kind of tendency. But he fastens on this one person, and he's not going to be lenient at all. He's not going to say, I understand that your father was a thief. I know this is probably part of your genes, part of your makeup. I know you've been stealing for a long time. Now, I know it's hard to stop. See, that's the way a psychiatrist would talk. That's not the way a man of God talks. 
Him that stole, that's the person who, who's a thief. In fact, the Greek word for stealing is klepto. <laughs> like kleptomaniac, you know, that's where, what it is. A thief is somebody who takes something that's not his and takes it to himself. Now, ordinarily, you think of things that, that it had to do with things, like you took some thing. I used to work with people who had to steal something every day, even if it was just a wooden pencil. They had to steal something from work every day, every day, steal something. Might have been a cheap old big pen, might have, but they had to steal something, take something that's not theirs. But more is involved in that. You can steal time. That's right. Yeah. Amen. Huh? Yeah. Well, there's people, they sell their time to their employer, then they use that time for their own. Yes. <laughs> well, I'm a Christian. You're a Christian? You sell your time, and then you use it for yourself? And you're a Christian? And you're a bad one if you are. Yeah, you can steal time. You can uh, take credit for something you didn't do. Yeah, yeah. Ah, that's stealing. Or you can use your life for self-interest when God has bought you with a price. Amen. That's stealing. Amen. That's stealing. Uh -huh. God didn't buy you so you could give advantages to the world. Uh -huh. that's right. He didn't now. Yeah. Uh, if you serve him, if the world can get advantages from you, that's, they'll get the best ones if you're serving him. Him that stole. See, so <laughs> you got to kind of stretch out your mind when you think about Amen. stealing. What, do you, what about the fellow that stole? Steal no more. That's it. Steal no more. Some other versions say, give up stealing. That's, that's too soft. Stop stealing. That, that's, that's good. Must stop stealing. Must now stop stealing. Quit stealing. Quit robbing. See, it's, got a, it's abrupt, see? <laughs> now I was a former thief. I was young. I was a thief. The world called a kleptomaniac. I was just an outright thief. You, you had to watch out. When I was a young boy, I'd steal something from you. Yeah. And I know that uh, from a personal viewpoint, it's not easy to stop doing that. I was in, a, in a, my later teens that I finally gained a victory over it. Well, if I stop stealing, though, immediately. When I when I, I was revived, I just stopped. But I but I had this temptation to do it. it I had to wrestle with it. It was it was hard because you got good at stealing. You could steal something, nobody see you, nobody knew, and it was just a little thing. And they've got plenty. And you know, you get all kind of reasons you can cite. Yeah. But stop. Yes. That's the word. No more. Stop it now. Now, actually, that's the same any fruit of the any work of the flesh. It's the same. It's the same reason. You could talk about adultery, fornication, uncleanness, lasciviousness, idolatry, witchcraft, hatred, variance, emulations, wrath, strife, seditions, heresies, envies, murders, drunkenness, revelings, and such like. Stop. Amen. There's no provision in salvation for a gradual reduction. There isn't. There's every provision for an instant cessation. Yes, see, you, see, this isn't just like a human effort. Uh -huh. Human effort is there. Every bit of effort you can give is involved, in fact. But it's not all that's involved. <laughs> it's like a little, yes. Of the kingdom. I mean, that's even right. this world was born, he said, let there be light, and there was yeah, light. There was wasn't light. a gradual day. That's right, and, amen. And ascension to light. There was light. Yeah. And, and the same thing when um, God healed anyone, it yeah. was that very same hour. That's right. It wasn't when um, the man who went to Christ told about his son and he was healed that very same hour. It wasn't when the 
father got home, he was healed. Yeah. He was healed along the way. He just he found out he was healed a long time ago. <laughs> he found out he was healed a time before, yeah. a little, uh, before he got there. Yeah. Yes. Yeah. And when the end, world ends, it's going to be instant. That's right. Amen. Now I got to just gradually got to fizzle out. It's going to be instant. So there's. There's no provision for sin to continue in any sense in Scripture, and there's every provision to, to stop the expression of it. Now, we understand that when it comes to the temptation and being drawn aside, that that, that doesn't just fly away. I mean, we can't be naive about this. But we're talking about the expression. Stealing is like an expression. It's not, I want to steal. You stop it there. You, you stop it in your mind, and then you won't do it. And your weapons of our warfare are mighty through God to do that. Yes, Sister Maddie. The world can't really understand how this is possible. That's because right. the world doesn't have the power of God holding them up and making them able to stop That's doing right. these things. That's what the whole problem that we had was, was we couldn't stop doing these things. But through Christ, we have the power to <coughs> put down these things and not take them up again. Amen. Amen. Now there's a little, a little bit of Jeremy, go ahead. Well, I was just going to say, uh, just to go along with that, I remember uh, when gas prices started going up, he said this caused people to steal gas, and I, I was like, no, they steal gas because they're thieves. <laughs> and uh, I, was, I thought about how you hear about these rich people getting caught stealing stuff at the stores. They have the money to do it, yeah. but they're thieves. Yeah, right. It doesn't matter if they get the money or not. That's right. This is a great thing, brethren, to be able to see that we have resources that are designed to bring glory to God. And salvation is such as you are involved at every level you're involved. But we might say at the quickening level, that, that maybe that's not as prominent at that time, but when you walking in newness of life, now here's how it's simplified. You are only given one day at a time to live. Yes. Well, and technically one minute if you want to eat. But the scripture speaks of one day. So you don't say, I'm not going to do this from now until December 31st. You say, I'm not going to do this today. Amen. Then Amen. tomorrow. See? This is how newness of life is. You live it a day at a time. Uh -huh. Today I'm going to appropriate what grace I can receive and I'm going to refrain from this. Tomorrow you may be able to get more grace than you got today. Uh -huh. And you may be tempted less or more than today, but you live it yes, amen. a day at a time. Yes. Withhold this, you're doing more damage yeah. than you could possibly imagine. That's right. Yes. Um, so a, text, a text that came to my mind as you were talking is in Romans 6, verse 15, that says, yeah. What then shall we send? Because we are not under the law, but under grace. God forbid. God forbid. That's right. Amen. Go ahead. Some, some will respond the way Brother Robert just said. Mm -hmm. Others will say, the grace of God. Well, that's throwing it all off on God. We're the ones who are responsible. <laughs> so you're giving people an out by talking about yeah. the grace of God and the power of God. Yeah. We're the ones who are responsible. Yeah. We're, we're giving them a means. It, it, mm -hmm. the, it, if you talk about a means, then that means you're you're extending the effort. But the means comes from God. See, that that's a secret. Wonderful, isn't it? <laughs> Well, you told me not to steal. That's if I can just manage not to steal. That allows, no, that's not enough. Yeah, that's, right. that's not enough. But rather, let him labor, working with his hands the things that which is good, that he may have to give to him that needeth. Now we'll see that refraining from sin is in order to do something else, like we put off the new man in order to put on the put off the old man in order to put on the new man. See, that's what the says. Seek, ceasing to sin is in order that you might work righteousness. Now let's look at this word rather. Technically, it means a greater degree, better, much more, a high point. 
the extent of something more. So it's not either or, like two equal things, either or. It's worse, better. Evil, good. The, of the devil of God. Keep with the nature of the new covenant, the child of God is to prefer what's better. Now, when you're faced with a temptation or a challenge or whatever, you've got to learn to think in terms of what's the better thing. Mary hath chosen the better thing. And it shall not be taken from her. She said, if you choose the better thing, God will see to it you don't lose it. Better. A lot of people choose the inferior thing. They, they default to what's inferior, and then they wonder why they're not growing. Now, I, it, this is at the point where the Spirit's got to make it personal, but we can be very personal about this. It's not the, is, is, is this bad? Is this the best? Did I make the best? See? Rather. Rather means the better, the best. I was looking at this concept of let, let. It's often a supplied word for easy reading. The idea here is the the underlying idea here is that what is required, the environment has been created for this to happen. Or we might say, whatever we call you to do, the door's been opened for that thing to be. See, that's in let. Yeah. means that you don't say let if the door is locked. Mm -hmm. You don't say let. <laughs> yeah. And this word is used 1,511 times in Scripture, let. And it presumes something's been done by God that allows for what the person's to do that allows for it to be done. All, all you have to do is, so to speak, let it loose. Loose the fetters to earth. It's mentioned nine times in Ephesians. Let, let. It means the salvation of God has produced an environment for you that allows for what this what he tells you to do. That a lot it can be done. Is doable. Let. In other words, the new man, he doesn't work unless he's given liberty to do so. Amen. Huh? That's, how, that's how it is. Now, he's created in true righteousness and holiness. He is. But see, until you put him on or you, you let you allow him to be, make the dominant decisions. He's the one that makes the overriding Decision, speaking as a man. And when this is done, newness of life is an environment where this, it just can be done. That's all. Let this mind be in you. See what? <laughs> yeah, it, it, well, several of them. You can pick them up in Scripture. Now, the nature of the new man is such that if it's, if it's not interfered with or it's, obstructed in some right. way, it will just move forward. That's right. It's designed to do that. That's exactly right. It's like a seed in the right environment. Amen. Will burst forth in life. Amen. He said, environment is everything. We're true ecologists, we believers. We're ecologists of so the first rank. Yes. Yeah. Spiritual ecology. Mm -hmm. Heavenly places, yes. A new creation. Now, he's not a follower. He's <laughs> yes, either going right. to lead good, or good. not. Yeah, mm -hmm. good. Mm -hmm. He's a leader. Amen. Yeah. Amen. The flesh, see, it's made to be a follower, but it wants to be a leader. But it's actually, it's, it's second. First, the, the new man is number one. Now, when he says let, <clears throat> this is like a summons to this instant response that we were talking about. Yeah. Let. So everything that would inhibit this from happening, God has handled all of that that, mm -hmm. that you can't control. And handle. He's handled all of that. So now that you've heard this word, just uh, let it break forth. The only way something preceded by let cannot be done 
is for the hearer to willingly allow a competing power to dominate him. <clears throat> That's the only way this can be done. But unfortunately, that can be that can be done. Satan cannot be resisted. So it's a summons to alertness and obedience. Let, see, that, in other words, that's like, that's like behold. It opens up the eyes and ears to something God wants done. He's not going to do it for you. He'll enable you to do it, but you've got to do it. But you've got to know this is his word coming to you. This is the voice of the Lord coming to you. And you've got to be, you don't lean, well, can I? No, when you say read the word let, that's automatically telling you you can do it. That it, Whatever would it stop this from happening, if you walk in newness of life, you'll be able to do it. Now, frankly, that's a great consolation to me. Because God does tell you to do some <laughs> challenging things. Let him labor, labor. The one that stole, that, that's the antithesis of stealing is labor. Uh -huh. Even though you have to be kind of creative to steal. You have to put out some effort to steal. But it's not counted as a, as a work of effort. It's just imputed to you as a sin. No? Labor, that's something else, labor. The word literally means to feel fatigue. <laughs> Work hard. And to be wearied. Other versions say, Work hard. Let him exert himself, toiling. When the disciples were rowing in a storm, and, and it's, they were waiting upon Jesus, and they said they continued toiling and rowing. It's, it's against, against the storm. Not rowing to shore, rowing away, <laughs> away from shore, toiling. When man sinned, he was consigned to hard labor. Harder than we normally think of labor. In the sweat of thy face shalt thou eat bread till thou return to the ground. Now, I used to be, sun came up, you worked, sun went down, you stopped. I mean, that's, so there's been some gracious, gracious provisions by God. Now this was actually a blessing. It was a, what we call a therapeutic curse. It was actually a blessing. But it was draped with the sackcloth of ardent activity. <laughs> Idleness and inactivity free the mind for the indulgence of imaginations. Imaginations. Hard work makes it more difficult for those to dominate. Let him work and dust. You see, if you have a job, some of you do that is very demanding. There's nothing pleasant about the demanding. We understand that. But there's a blessing in it. Yeah, that's right. Inside there is a blessing. Amen. You won't have as much time to be diverted. Yeah. Amen. And in it you're learning. You're learning yeah. to optimize what time you do have. Yes. Amen. Go ahead, Brother Bob. Everybody that steals technically is stealing the fruit of another man's that's labor. Right. That's yeah. exactly right. Let him labor. Work hard. A thief, I would gather, should work especially hard, yeah. which would reduce the tendency to be a thief. Yes. Amen. But it's got to be the thing that's good. <coughs> Other versions read something useful. It's going to tone down. Work honestly. Do good work. Do something good with your hands. Do good acts. Some honest job. Well, the thing that is good is work that does not require dishonesty or involvement in matters that are not good in God's eyes. That's a good good work. He's not talking about a good work. He's talking about good employment. He said, let him work that which is good, have a good job. I mean, don't become a unloader on a beer truck. I mean, that, maybe you can make a good buck doing that, but that's really not the... Don't become a chauffeur down there at one of those Oklahoma casinos. You know what I mean? Make it, but that's, not, that's not a work that's good there. Don't be a harlot and sell your body. You may be, become independently wealthy doing that. But that's not, not, not a good work. 
weren't good. It's even under the law, it all mentions the price of a whore or the price of a dog. I wanted to read out the NIV because dog means male prostitute. A weak world would call homosexual. You must not bring the earnings of a female prostitute or of a male prostitute into the house of the Lord your God to pay any vow because the Lord your God detests them both. They have, they have a word on that. So when someone says, we ought to love thee, so forth, so forth. Well, you going to love the ones God detests? You tell me whether you've got the nerve to do that. Whether you want to be found loving somebody God detests. Now, why is he supposed to do this? Labor is good. The, the, uh, the employment itself must be something you could do as unto God without any qualm of conscience. So, why do you do that? Well, so that way you won't have to steal anymore. That's what people think, see? Yeah. Or that way you'll have what you need. That's not what he says. He says that he might have to give to him that needeth. Amen. That maybe him that needeth is the guy he stole from. Yeah. Maybe he's needy because he... <laughs> so it, is, it soars far beyond the flesh. Yes, amen. Now you're working so you can give it away. Right. Amen. You some people can't see that. Yeah. They yeah. just... Boy, they just... Even though people today make more money than they ever have made. Yeah, right. it's, it's all like this. Let them labor you might have to give them a half need. Now Paul said the same thing to the Corinthians a little different way. It's Second, uh, Second Corinthians 9.8. God is able to make all grace abound toward you so that you always, having all sufficiency so you'll not lack anything essential, all sufficient in all things may abound to every good work. So anytime anyone has a need, you'll have some to give. Amen. You say, well, that's not the way we are. We just live by the skin of our teeth. We just live from month to month, week to week, day to day. We never have, well, you've got to get to work on this now. You've got to get out of that category. This was said to a thief. What do you suppose he says to the rest of the people? You think this is just word for the thief? You can believe this. You can live so in such a manner that you'll have enough in your pocket always to always get what you need. And in the other pocket, you'll have enough that if some plea comes from someone that needs something, like the poor says, you'll be able to give. God's able to give you that much. And he can actually put more in the giving pocket in the receiving pocket. <laughs> now this, of course, takes faith, you understand. So this contradicts the manner of life, see, the world. The world doesn't, the world doesn't think this way, but this is, this is how God is. And God's not going to let his people suffer lack. I mean, he, if he thinks about birds, he thinks about you, you may be sure. If he considers the flowers of the field, he's not going to leave you unclothed. That's right. Whether you live in the Arctic Circle or in Florida, mm -hmm. he won't let that happen. Yeah. person's got to believe that. Yeah. So that's the word for the thief. <laughs> now he goes on to speak. He says, let no corrupt communication proceed out of your mouth. Now we, we do need to keep in mind that Paul's just not outlining a certain kind of life. Here's five steps to profitable living, this sort of thing. He, he's not specifying, these are ideal things, kind of target, kind of target doing these, but these are like ideal, you, you may not get it done, and you may never be satisfied with what you do, but just kind of target, work toward this end. That's not the type of thing he's saying at all. This is a description of newness of life. Yeah. He's telling you what it is, how it's lived. What he's talking about now is to newness of life what the Ten Commandments were to the Old Covenant. They were to morality, rather. What the Ten Commandments were to morality, this kind is, is to spiritual life. 
As Paul stated the case well. Sister Bailey's read this already. For sin shall not have dominion over you, for you're not under law, but under grace. What then? What then? Shall we sin because we're not under the law, but under grace? God forbid. Well, some people don't actually ask that question, but they do live in that manner. They say, God's gracious, he'll understand. I know I really shouldn't do it, but you know. Thank God he loves us. Now let's look at this corrupt communication. What is that? Don't no corrupt communication. Some of us really botch this up. They really, really botch it up. Some say corrupt word, that's good. Unwholesome word, that's good. Unwholesome talk, that's good. Evil talk, harmful language, corrupting talk, filthy communication, rotten word, that's terrible. Dirty talk, bad. Foul language, bad. No foul or polluting language or evil word or unwholesome or worthless talk. Well, that pretty kind of covers it. You might be interested, this word communication is translated from the Greek word logos. Now, if you listen to media preachers, they'll mention the logos quite a bit, but they, after they mention it, they don't really know what they're talking about. The word logos doesn't have to do with a word, a word. Election. That that's not the that's not a logos word. Logos has to do with a message or a statement of some kind. It's a, it's a thought expressed in words, not a single word. I understand that profanity is included in this, but that's not the focus here. Or expletives, that's not the focus here. Some uh, corrupt sayings or corrupt, a corrupting, corrupt communication is a corrupt saying. A corrupt saying, it's rotten. It won't hold up under examination. Is uh, well, God helps those that help themselves. That's a corrupt word. Or, you cannot do anything to make God love you less. That's a corrupt word. Or do not be so heavenly minded, you're no earthly goods. That's a corrupt word. Corrupt saying. It may be some kind of sectarian cliche. But it's something that's not true. It will also include profanity, we understand. And, but it also include like false doctrine. Phrases like the rapture of the church. That's a corrupt word, see. Or the revival of the Roman Empire, the thousand-year reign of Christ, or the sinner's prayer. Those are corrupt words. Yes. The life of God is not in them. Mm -hmm. They're not spirit-breathed, so they will decline, deteriorate, and lose whatever supposed power uh -huh. they have. Let no corrupt communication come out of your mouth. Don't let it. David said, keep, keep thy tongue from evil and thy lips from speaking guile. Don't let it come out. Yeah. Now for some, see, a quick-tempered person, this is, uh, this is going to call some, for some effort to do this. David said, I'll keep my mouth with a bridle. How about that? Micah spoke of the doors of thy mouth. Yeah. Yeah. <laughs> Yeah, so when the doors of your mouth open up, let something come out. It's good for edifying. And James said, now that the tongue can no man tame. It's an unruly evil full of deadly poison. See, you, no man can tame it. Ah, but God can. Amen. God can tame it. Amen. God can put a new nature in you that can handle that tongue. Amen. Good to know, isn't it? Now, sometimes the only thing to do is to physically put your hand over your mouth and not let anything come out of it. And I give you the scriptures where they said that. I'm going to lay my hand on my mouth. <clears throat> now, if you're quick-tempered and irritable like I am sometimes, 
I've had to do this. And sometimes I wish I would have done it a little bit quicker. Just clamp your hand over your mouth and not let anything come out. That's how serious this is. Amen. Don't let it come out of your mouth because you, one thing you can't, you can't call back your words. Oop, pull them back in. If they're defiling words, they've already dumped garbage on everybody and you can't, you can't, right. <laughs> you can't take them back. Don't, so don't let it. Don't let corrupt, decaying, worldly, earthly things that are going to pass away. Don't let that kind of stuff come out of your mouth. But that which is good for the use of edifying. Now this acts very briefly stated. There's a lot in this verse here. Some of the versions kind of give you a hint. They call it good for necessary edification. That's the use of. Others say, but only such a word is as good for edification according to the need of the moment. That's it. That is in this. Here's another Helpful for building others up according to their needs. You, that is, they didn't tell you, you discern the needs. You spoke the appropriate word. And only such speech is as good and beneficial to the spiritual progress of others as is fitting to the need and the occasion. On the day of Pentecost, Peter stands up to speak. It was suitable for the occasion. <laughs> huh? And Paul reasoned with Felix about righteousness, temperance, and judgment to come. It was suitable for the occasion. And so that's, that calls for discernment. Like you don't, you don't sit among people who are devoted wholly to God and are they're loving the Lord and, they, and, and you stand them and say, don't commit fornication, any of you. You got to have a little better word than that. Well, if there's someone committing it, well, then that's another story. But you understand what I'm saying? you got to have an appropriate word. Amen. Now, you may, when you stand before the brothers or sisters, you may have something that's really heavy on your heart you want to say, but you got to pass it through the filter of not only I want to say it, but do they need to hear it. you got to, that's right. you got to pass it through that filter now. This may, be, this may have been a word that's preparing you to say something instead of giving you something to say. You've got to be able to detect that, see? Now, we don't want anyone speaking things that they haven't personally tasted themselves. But this, this, is, this is beyond that. When you do speak something you've tasted of yourself, make sure it's appropriate to the, to the occasion. And this will call for some discernment. This is what Solomon would call words fitly spoken, see? It is what Isaiah called a word in season. See, that's the type type of thing we're talking about here. It means a speech that is good for edifying is driven by some discernment. Now, this is what Paul did when he wrote his epistles. This is exactly what he did. He wrote them in view of the condition of the churches. This is what Jesus did to the seven churches of Asia. He spoke to them a word that was appropriate for where they were at. This is an example of the head speaking through the members to the body. Amen. <laughs> Jesus, he knows, he knows the status and the need of the body. Yeah. So if you, if you hold to the head, he'll give you a word that's appropriate yeah. for where they're at or if they're being tested or if they're being blessed. There's a pro words that are appropriate for that. Condition, if somebody's going through a knot hole, speak appropriate word. Sure. I think that it is discernment is the ability to speak uh, very precisely yes. instead of with more generalities and yeah. broad. Yeah. Yes, <laughs> good, good. Mm -hmm. Yeah, really good. And I can remember you standing up to preach and you would say, well, I prepared this sermon, but I'm not going to preach it. I'm going to give you something else. And it was powerful it was for the moment. It was what you're talking about. It was it was it was something that you, you saw you discerned that the message I prepared wouldn't fit right now. Yeah. And you, yeah. But that's an, a good example of yes. being ready. See that newness of life. You can do this. This we're not talking about like Superman mm -hmm. requirements. When you hold to the head and you walk in newness of life, this type of thing 
can happen. You can let it happen. It can just happen. You may not personally know the precise situation, but you will be speaking very precisely, even though you may not have seen it yet yourself. But you've detected this would be a good word to say at this, at this time. Word fitly spoken. Why? Why? So I can minister grace. Yes. This, uh, what precedes this, it, and then what you're talking about now and about to talk about, this has to do with sanctifying ourselves unto the Lord. Lord. Mm -hmm. Amen. And not being a dirty vessel that can't be used. Because mm -hmm. I can tell you right now, if, if you're a person that is known for any of these things, mm -hmm. even if you do say a good word, yeah. who's going to listen to you? That's right. right. You're That's not right. a sanctified vessel. People know you're not a fit medium for that message. Mm -hmm. Amen. That it may minister grace to the hearers. I was telling you that things that minister grace to the hearers are things that people can associate with where they are in Christ. They can kind of see how this fits in to where they're at in Christ Jesus. And we're not just talking about earthly circumstances. Understand, we're not just talking about earthly trial that a person's going through. That's not what we're talking about. We're talking about where a person is in Christ Jesus and what they are seeing at the moment. Now, there are some brothers and sisters who yesterday saw things really pretty clear, and today they're really kind of foggy. Now, if you're sensitive, you can pick you can pick up on this, and you can take that jewel out that's been covered up by circumstance, polish it up, and set it out before them again. It's a word fitly spoken. See, so this God's people don't remain like in a static position, just just stay at this level just for the next so long. There's there's some times when you're the storms are there, and the furnace is there, and so forth. Then there's some times when they're eating the grapes of Eshcol. I mean, what kind of word do you tell the people who are eating the grapes? Yes, amen. If they can make the connection between what you said and where they're at, grace will be ministered to them. So this word is like a, like a bird that's carrying, carrying, a mess, carrying comfort. <laughs> it is God's carrier pigeon, and it's a carrying comfort to the people. But you can't say it unless you stopped sending, and unless you've, you're putting on a new man and conducting yourself in newness of life, so you can't even do this unless this has been done. Grace. See, grace, that's what makes salvation effective. We're saved by grace. See, that's what makes it effective. And faith is the hand that gets hold of grace. It's by grace through faith. See, faith comes by hearing. So here comes the word. The word of his grace. The gospel of his of the grace of God. Here comes the word. Grace. Grace is coming along with it, see. And it ministers. Is this what it says? It ministers. That your word ministered. Amen. Grace to the hearer. Right. Your word. So don't tell that wasn't me. Yeah. It's your word that ministered right. the grace. Don't say that wasn't me. It was the Lord that did it. It wasn't me. We know that already. Don't be. <laughs> it's strike that from your vocabulary. Someone says, I appreciate the word you said. Just say, well, thank you. Yes, amen. It's always in order. So thank you very much. In Jesus' name, thank you. Yes, thank you for being a good hearer. Whatever. You gotta see that now that the, your word ministered grace to the mm -hmm. here. That is God. Now God is the one that manipulates grace. I mean, you can't take grace and dole it out. But God can, but here he does it through your word. Just fitly spoken word. Words that minister grace to the hearers are words, sayings, messages that reflect some aspect of God's great salvation. Yeah that particularly connects with this person where they're at. Like when J. Paul was in prison, Onesiphorus 
sought him out. It doesn't say what he said or what it was like, but it been, for the moment, that's what Paul needed a visit from a brother yes. at that moment. And he revived, took heart because of it. So they, they tend to, these, a word that ministers grace tends to elevate a person's status in Christ and show is not that important what circumstance they're in. I think I'll close there. Any, do you have a word you'd like to add? I was thinking about um, when you were talking about this uh, steal no more, abruptly come to a stop. I thought about how flesh, what well, flesh will say is, well, we'll start tomorrow. <laughs> yeah. Well, we're, gonna, we're serious about this, but we're, let's just start tomorrow. But we know that tomorrow is not promised to us. And I, I like right. how you said that, that we take it even moment by moment. No, we're going to start now. Yeah. And this moment, we're not going to steal. And That's then we're, right. Then we're going to get next moment, and we're going to get through the rest That's of the day. Right. And then tomorrow we're going to start again. That's how life is lived in Christ. See? That's Amen. the way it's lived. That's right. There's more than one kind of commodity to steal from people. You can steal their earthly goods, but you can also take things that are theirs in Christ Jesus and cloud them up with your words, right, with right. your teaching, your doctrines. You make them to where they're of none effect. You've stolen them from the people. Yeah. And so this is this can't be. I mean, you you can't do this. You yeah. need to stop doing that uh -huh. and, and labor in the word and the doctrine to be able to speak things that are seasoned with salt to where you're actually giving things to the people. Yeah. You're helping Amen. them see things. Amen. Rather than stealing from them. Just a barb. Yeah. Word. Yeah, I was thinking about these two examples in this text of cutting something off and replacing yeah. it with something, something better. And we've talked about this several times. It goes back to the parable Jesus told about the house being swept but then not yeah. filled again. Yeah. And it was made worse in yeah. the end than it was in the beginning. And so mm -hmm. I used to I used to have the mindset that when you cut something off, lying or stealing or whatever, then you have in readiness something that when you're tempted, you can combat that temptation. But now I see that at the point when you cut off the sin, yeah. that's the point when something is replaced. Amen. The good is put in its place so that when the temptation comes, there's actually no place for it. And Amen. that's what gives you power to overcome. Amen. That's good. Mm -hmm. That's good. Someone's living in the house. Yes, it's me. I was reminded of this uh, thought that is presented in James about a fountain not being able yeah. to bring forth bitter yeah. water and sweet water at the yeah. same time. And this yeah. uh, corrupt communication is like the bitter, bitter water. water. Right. But, and you can't bring forth the sweet until you've, re you've removed the bitter, uh, the whatever was making it, it bitter. And so this is uh, how we're able to minister grace through our speech is that we have we've put off this corrupt communication that was our former manner of conversation and we ha we now have a good conversation. Amen. Amen. Good. Yes, Brother Gene? The last section of your lesson here, another phrase came to me, a phrase of false doctrine that we've all been exposed to. The plan of salvation. Plan of salvation. Mm -hmm. That's right. The context of that. That's mm -hmm. right. You're Deceiving. Right. And it leads down a You're right. path to mm -hmm. It's corrupt. You're exactly yes. right. It Amen. tends to deteriorate, doesn't it? Mm -hmm. The more yes. you focus on it, the, the, the more it deteriorates. Yep. It takes God out of the picture. Yeah. Well, that's what corrupt means. God's not in it. That's yeah. right. Yeah. See, God's the living God. Yeah. He's the yeah. God of the living, not of the dead. Yes, amen. Mm -hmm. Amen. Dead people are dead saints either. <laughs>